go. All right. Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Sabbath. Wonderful to be here. Welcome, everybody here in Woodstock and everybody online to Truth on the Web Ministries and Church of God Woodstock's weekly Sabbath sermon series. It's a pleasure to be here. And we're going to be doing part three of Romans, and this is going to cover chapters three and four. And we're going to just jump right in. Not a whole lot of pretext. Um, so chapter three, we will start there. So verses one and two I have on the screen here. We actually read these at the end of part two there to kind of connect the chapters together. So I'll reread them again here, <coughs> and then I will do a very brief contextual summary just to connect the dots so we can move forward. So Romans three, verses one and two. What advantage then has the Jew or what profit is there of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. So this verse is on the tails, essentially, of the points that he was bringing forward in chapters 1 and chapters 2, that um, as far as God is concerned, all are guilty of sin, that all need redemption, and that there is only one way that any man that has ever lived or will live can be redeemed, and that is by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And that there is no preference in that aspect or respect of humanity. There's no advantage that the Jew has over the Gentile. So it's so Paul, I think here is kind of, I was maybe a little hard on the Jews, not intentionally, but the points that you were making were important. That he's going to say, look, there was definitely, the Jews did have an advantage. The, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob definitely had an advantage over the rest of mankind. And we'll get into a little bit um, a little later on today and actually in further parts um, what that advantage was. But I just want to summarize the fact that the reason, the main reason Paul is making this point here is that, the, look, the Jews did have, they are God's elect. They are his chosen people. That's not, you can't say that of any other group of people that have ever existed in all of human history. There were individuals. <clears throat> Today, the church is the body that houses his his saints, but that's not the same thing as the chosen people or the elect. That's a different thing. It's not the same. The, the, the role that the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob played in human history as a result of God's election is unique and special and definitely not to be repented of in any way. So he does actually in chapter 9 kind of expand on this a little bit. And so I'll read some verses from 9, Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5 here. Um, so the Israelites to whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenants, the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. So a couple of things I want to point out here when Paul finishes that verse out who is overall God bless forever. He's talking about Christ, not Israel necessarily. He's talking about Christ, who is overall and God blessed forever. Um, and so these are other advantages that the Jews, the physical Israelites, can claim over all other humanity. God made it that way. He did it because he promised it to Abraham that he would do it. So that certainly is not anything to, to be unhappy about. So then he goes on. Now, once he's clarified that, he's kind of going to pick up the point that he was making in chapter 2, that um, all mankind, to one extent or another, is under a law. The Israelites, through Moses, was given the law from Sinai. Um, but all mankind had a law. And Paul talked about that in Romans chapter 2 in quite detail. And so if you're want to look at some of that, please read it or go back in, on YouTube and look at part two. I talked about that some more. But Paul here going on in Romans 3, verses 3 and 4, the first half of verse 4. He then says he makes a kind of people have objections. He says, well, yeah, so some chosen people they were. Look, most of them rejected Messiah. Look, at if you read scripture, and this is in no way talking ill of Israel. It's just what's in the book. And it's not like any other people group would have done better than Israel did. Certainly not. But if you read the history of Israel as it's laid out in the Old Testament, it's in many points, it's not something to be proud of. They were a disobedient, stiff-necked people. They just were. Um, and so the objection that many had or might have is that, well, if those are his special chosen people, and look how they acted, 
well, what's the big deal? Who do you think you are? So that's what Paul's saying here. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Ye let every man be true, or let God be true, but every man a liar. So Paul is essentially doing a little philosophical argument here. People are going to say, hey, look at this. So it's a mess. And Paul says, ah, just because some did not believe, some were not faithful, does not make God unfaithful. And it's not a matter of reputation. God's not concerned per se with how we think of him as whether we think, but he is the embodiment of glory and perfection. So if we think contrary to that about him, we are thinking falsely and incorrectly, and that's going to harm us. And he does not want us to be harmed. He cares for us and he loves us. Let's take a look at uh, another example of this in Exodus 32. We've got verses 9 through 14, although I actually don't have all of those verses here. I've sort of skipped through and edited some stuff out. So please feel free to read in your scriptures the entire account there. I'm not trying to pull a fast one. But I, I'm just going through here and picking the points that Paul is talking about. So Exodus 32, verses 9 through 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, turn from thy fierce wrath. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom you swore by your own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven. And all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. So again, another example here where God's plan is going to unfold and it's going to happen. And Moses understood that as well. So Moses is essentially making that same, that same point. It's like, look, you said it, so you know it's going to happen. The writer of the Hebrews for the same thing all at once, sort of belaboring this point. Hebrews 6, we're going to read verses 13 through 20. We've got 13 through 17 on the screen here. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater. Oh, is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutable immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. So in other words, the writer of the Hebrews here is saying, God did this to demonstrate to us today just how firm and concrete and absolute his promise is. So that he did it by two things, as we'll pick up in the next verse here. That by two immutable things, that means unchanging, impossible things. So by two things, one, that God cannot ever lie. And then two, he made an oath. So by two things, it cannot be broken that are immutable. God said it. And then God swore and promised that it would happen. So he did that for us, for our purpose. Um, it's a similar thing we read where Jesus is praying and he says, I don't pray because I know you hear me. I pray so that they hear, so that when my prayers answer, they'll understand that you are with me, Father. I think it's, this was for us. Um, Paul, <clears throat> a similar thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and about some of the things of Israel in the wilderness. He said that those things were written for us, for our admonition, for our warning, so we can understand that we should stand fast, lest we fall. So going on to what the writer of the Hebrews says here, he says here, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, <clears throat> which hope we have with an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus, made in high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So what the writer of the Hebrews here is saying is that this is our hope the fact that God cannot lie, and the fact that he has promised. No one is going to thwart his purpose, thwart his purpose, and he has promised that he will do it. And so this is the anchor of the soul. This is the root of our hope. That's why in Hebrews, later on in chapter 11, he says, faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Hope, you know, hope. It's the hope. 
So that's why this is important. That's why it matters that. So when Paul is talking in Romans, where he says, let God be true and every man a liar, he's just saying, look, no man can thwart what God has said will happen, that our hope should be firm and strong in that 100%. So going back to Romans 3, verses 4b, finishing up that verse, he said here, as it is written, that you might be justified in your sayings and might overcome when you are judged. So Paul says here that his word is firm and absolute and just and perfect. And so as a result, he will be just and justified, and he'll be able to overcome any argument that any man or woman might be able to have against his word in that final day. Also, as a somewhat of a side note, I find it interesting here, that in chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, um, 2.24, Paul said, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. And that's actually a direct allusion to 2 Samuel 12.14, which God said to David through Nathan in the matter of Bathsheba and the sin against Uriah. So this verse here actually is also a quote from Psalm 51, which is connected directly with what happened with Bathsheba. So in two, just twice now, Paul has alluded back to that. So this verse here goes back to that, because if you read Psalm 51, verse 4, it says that you might be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge. So picking up in verses 5 through 8. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? So now he's making another argument, another objection. So this is an objection people might have. So he's raising it, and he's going to answer the objection. And so, interestingly, we'll see here, in the previous verse, he essentially used a scriptural defense for the objection. Here he's going to use a more philosophical one. He's going to say, okay, so if this, then it just naturally concludes to this outcome. So let's take a look at what Paul says here. So I, I remember during the uh, overview, I'd said that Paul, throughout this letter, uses a combination of, of arguments, of, me- of methods of argument, and one of them is using Scripture to answer to doubts or questions like this, and other ones are philosophical, where he'll say, well, let's just kind of take it to the natural conclusion. If this is true, let's see where that leads you. So that's what he's going to do here. So, but if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who takes vengeance? And then he says here, essentially, I speak as a man. God forbid, then how shall judge God judge the world? For if the truth of God has more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as some slanderously reported and some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. So Paul is making the argument here, all right, um, if some kind of good comes out of what I do, some evil that I do, then how can God find fault with me? And that's the argument. I'm actually going to dig into this a little later in one of the further themes um, in this sermon, so I don't want to go too much off on a rabbit trail. But the point here that Paul is making in general is that God is just in taking vengeance, and there is never an excuse for doing evil. Just because God may be able to use that evil for his good and his glory, Balaam is an excellent example. So we still today can read the prophecies in Numbers that God passed through Balaam to mankind about Israel and be edified by them. But Balaam did not receive a, a, a gift for those because his heart was not right. In fact, he got ran through by a sword. That was his for his own spirit and his own heart. So we'll dig into that, actually, a little later in one of the further themes. Paul actually kind of talks about the same thing again in Romans 9, verses 14 through 16. He says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God that shows mercy. 
and skipping down a few verses later in 9, verses 19 and 20, Paul picks up here and he says, Thou wilt say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say unto him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? So that sounds, people have this argument about God. Well, if he's this big, all-powerful, then he must be forcing us to do what we don't want to do. So Paul responds here. He says, no, God knows better than you. Let's take a look at Job, kind of the same situation. Let's take a look at it, an explanation of this in Job 38, verses 1 through 5. So the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Now, just imagine being a human being and having God say this to you. So, gird up now the loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? It's like, uh, I, I, I wasn't there. Um, declare, if you have understanding, who has laid the measures thereof, if you know, or who has stretched the line upon it. So, essentially, God is letting Job know here, and he actually... This, for many verses, he gives examples of this. He lets Job and us through this book know that God knows much more than we do. His ways are not our ways. And so things that may seem askew or unfair to us, God knows much more than we do. So who are we to reply to him? If he says this is the way it needs to be, that's the way it needs to be, period. Who are we to reply to him? It's not that he's some big ogre and some big bully. It's not. He has always our absolute best in mind. Everything he has designed is for us to be able to benefit from, both here in this life and ultimately to live forever with him if we will but yield and receive his gift. That's all there is to it. So we have no excuse to be able to, to complain to him, well, 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 it's not fair. Who can resist? If you said something's going to happen, how can I? I mean, Yes. How come they got all the cool stuff and I didn't? God's ways are not our ways. He knows much better. So that's one of the arguments that people may have. And Paul is countering that argument and explaining, no, that is not a valid argument. So the next set of verses um, in Romans 3, verses actually 9 through 18, um, are kind of Paul's scripture mashup. So he sort of kind of takes a bunch of different scriptures and sort of puts them together. Some are direct quotes. Some are allusions to other scriptures. So we'll read through this, and I'll, I'll reference a couple of the Old Testament scriptures that he's using here. But So Romans uh, 3, verses 9 through 12 here. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have proved before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. So that's what he did in chapter 1 and chapter 2. All Jews, all Gentiles. So here I believe when he's saying, are we better than they? No, in no wise. I believe that part of the verse, he's kind of talking to the Jewish audience. Because he's a Jew. He's like, what, are we better than the Gentiles? Because, and he says, no, in no way. Because we've already proved that everybody's under sin. And then he goes on to say, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that does good, no, not one. And actually, these are several references from like Ecclesiastes 7.20, Psalm 14, verses 2 and 3, Psalm 53, verses 2 and 3. So I'm not going to read those. They're very similar. Um, and there actually are other scriptures that are also very similar. So this is, Paul is laying this out. Again, he is emphasizing this point. We're all, we are all under sin, every one of us, Jew and Gentile alike. It's a point that he drives home time and time again in this letter and in other writings that he has here. So picking up in verse 13 through 18 here. He continues on, their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And um, there's just, those are all kinds of references from the Old Testament. Psalm 5, verses 9 through 10. 
Psalm 10, verse 7. Psalm 36, verse 1. Psalm 140, verse 3. And Isaiah 59, verses 7 through 8, to name a few. Again, there are others, actually. But every time Paul kind of takes a step forward, he steps back and says, look, you're all under sin. So in in Galatians, it seems that the main issue was that there were Gentiles who were, for whatever reason, aspiring to become Jewish. In Rome, it doesn't seem like that necessarily was a situation because he doesn't ever admonish the Gentiles to stop doing that. But he certainly is admonishing his Jewish audience, his Israeli audience, to not think they're better than the Gentile saints because they're not. And there is no difference, not in regards to salvation. So he keeps reiterating that point over and over again. He does it here. He did it in chapter 1. He did it in chapter 2. He's going to do it again in further chapters because it's an important point, and it's one of the main themes that Paul is emphasizing in this epistle to the Roman saints. So I haven't reiterated that point again, that all are under sin, that there's nobody that's good, none seek after him. He picks back up in verses 19 and 20. And he says here, Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. This is a really interesting couple verses here. And what law is he talking about? So in general, I would imagine the readers of this letter back in the time when he wrote it would have thought of the law of Moses. That's generally what. But he made clear in chapter 2 that not all mankind is under the law. It was under the law of Moses. That the Gentiles were a law unto themselves, their conscience either excusing or accusing them, that they're God-given conscience. So in principle, the law that he is talking about that all are under is the general law of God. Israel was given the law by Moses as well, but the law that we are all, that all mankind is under, that all mankind whose mouths will be stopped, is the law that has existed from the beginning until the end. And it's not just the law of Moses. And he'll talk about that in chapter 5. I'll just, in, uh, in Romans 5, Paul talks about how death reigned from Adam to Moses, although there was no law that they did not sin after the similitude of Adam or the likeness. And what that means is that Adam was given by the mouth of God direct things to do. Adam, do this, don't do this. Adam disobeyed that. Moses and Israel through Moses was given, do this, don't do this. Between there, mankind had no oracle, no place where God was, was talking to man and telling that man here, do this. There were individuals, Abraham, Noah, Enoch, absolutely so. But mankind as a whole had no law, and yet they still died. It says here, oh, actually, we'll come out in a little bit. So so he says, and we're going to go into also, um, every mouth may be stopped in one of the further themes later on in the sermon. So I'm not going to dwell on that part too much. So let's take a look at my notes here. So this is a very... <laughs> I mean, this is quite a statement, and it raises some red flags for many people. And so, I came into I've, I've came into Christianity through normal mainstream Sunday stuff, and I, I was not by any means really converted at that time. When I started going to that church, I wasn't. I mean, I had some some concerns about what was going on in my life and the things that I was doing in my life, and by God's grace, He was convicting me of those, but. Um, and I don't want this to sound come off like I thought I was better than them because it was not that whatsoever. But when God truly did convert my heart, I realized that there were a lot of people that seemed to be taking a very licentious approach to their Christian walk. And, and it was difficult for me because, I, I mean, I knew just months before I'd been doing the same kind of stuff. So I hardly could, like, say, what, you know, I mean, it's like one day I'm doing it, next day I'm not. Who do you think you are to just say something about it? 
but it was it was tearing me up inside. And so I thought, so what, where my mind went was, okay, I, I can't do those things. I know I can't do that stuff. Um, and yet other people who were claiming to be Christians who were going to the same church I was going to were doing the kind of stuff that I knew God did not want. And I'm not talking about just like having long hair or getting a tattoo or whatever. I mean, stuff where they're like fornicating, you know, living with their girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever, doing, you know, committing adultery stuff, you know, being angry all the time and gossiping about, I'm talking about stuff like that. So it's not just something in my mind where I had my own standard of this is how people should be. So they don't meet up with that. I mean, I'm talking about real stuff that's in the book that, that God had put in my spirit and convicted me. I, I can't do that's wrong. It is wrong to do that. There's no, there is no occasion when it is proper for me to gossip about people and go around and, and just take joy out of telling others about other people's shortcomings or misery or whatever it is. It's, it's never good, for example. And I know it wasn't good for them either, and yet they would do it, and, and I was not able to. I would try to approach some of them sometimes on it and not. I almost got run over in a parking lot one time by a guy because he had, like, blown up at other people. And so just I went out in the parking lot when he was in his car. It was just the two of us, so I wasn't, like, making a scene in front of anybody else and just, hey, you can't. That's, you can't be like that. What have we got to do? And so he got all mad and he just like took off. I mean, I was standing next to the car. He almost ran me over. So I'm just saying it's that kind of stuff. It was that kind of stuff. So where my mind went was, was to the law. Then, oh, well, so see, I need a firm, concrete list that I can just throw in their face. Here you go. Boom. Now, there certainly are scriptures that says we're not supposed to be full of wrath or malice or anger. But there's also a scripture that says, well, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So people can take that and twist it and say, oh, well, so I can be angry during the day just as long as I'm not angry when I go to sleep. <laughs> they do that to their own destruction. I understand that. <laughs> so, again, if there's a clear-cut, engraved in stone list, then it makes it so much easier for the flesh, but yet at the same time, it does not make it easier for the flesh because the flesh can never live up to that stuff. It's by the Spirit. So. When Paul here is talking about being under the law, he means exactly that. We're not. We do not have a list of things to which we must aspire to achieve on a daily basis. It's absolutely not the Christian walk. If that is your Christian walk, then you have missed something of it. That does not mean you're not a Christian. And that does not mean that there are not things that Christians should bring forth and fruit that they should bear. But the Christian experience is not about a list of things. And we'll get into it a little bit deeper a little later. Um, but he says here that it says to them that who are under the law that every mouth shall be stopped and all the world become guilty before him. That, um, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So, for example, Azerbaijan has its own laws. I've never been there. I had to do a spell check to spell it right in my notes, for example, because... Um, but they have their own laws. But their laws are completely irrelevant to me because I am not under that. Now, if I were to go there, then I would be under those laws, at least to a certain extent. As a U.S. citizen, I might have some that I don't have to pay attention to, but nonetheless, that would still be in the law. So Paul is making the same argument here. And what law is he talking about? Well, it is the law that he talked about in Romans chapter 2. There's no getting around it. There's no context where it can be any other law that he is talking about. This is not some law that wicked men added on top of God's law. This is not some other human-based law. This is the law. And it says that those things are spoken to those who are under the law. And it says that, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. We're going to look at that a little later in some more depth. So like I said, I want to stay to the main themes that Paul is making here. Um, and it's, it's very clear. It's, I mean, this, those verses are straightforward. There's not any, the, the context before this and the preceding chapters and verses and in the chapters and verses that come after this make it very clear there's only one law that he's talking about. And it is the law by which every man is going to be judged when they stand before God. 
and explain what that is in, in Romans chapter 2 very well. And it's not necessarily just the law of Moses, but it is the law. And that law is for the knowledge of sin. Skipping on to verses 21 through 23, Paul says here, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. But there's only one law he can be talking about, the same law he was talking about in the preceding verses. He says here, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Being witnessed by the law and prophets. So if you look back in the law, you can see foreshadowings and types of this righteousness without the law. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. And finishing out verse 23. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And all have only one hope, Jesus Christ and his righteousness that is imputed unto us, if we but believe, not by keeping the law. Carrying on, verses 24 through 26 being justified freely by his, Christ, by his grace to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. In those verses mean exactly what he's saying. It is, it is, we are justified freely by his grace to those who it's not by the law. And we're going to look at a little later here, the law. Some like to try, try to twist this and say, well, the law he's talking about here is the law of sacrifice. No, it's not. And we'll look at that in a little more depth here in a little bit. And finishing this chapter out, verses 27 through 31, Paul says here, where is boasting then? It is excluded. It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles. Seeing is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. So I want to emphasize one thing here. Um, he uses two groups of people. So he says, Jews and Gentiles. There, is he God of the Jews only? Is he not also the Gentiles? Yes, the Gentiles also. And then he goes on and he says, shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. That's just two, the same two groups of people. The Jews equals the circumcision, which are the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all 12 tribes, not just Judah and Benjamin, and a smattering of Levi. That is all 12 tribes. So the word Jews in the New Testament refers to, in general, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some want to make the point that, no, Jew is Judah. That's why it's, well, yes, it absolutely is, because the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, is the one that God kept around into modern Roman times. So that's the name that they were given. We were, you know, we're known as Americans, but it doesn't mean that's just a name that's been applied to us. We're from all different places. So the word Jew was the, the, the vernacular, the word of the day during Roman times to, that was applied by non-Jews and Jews alike. You can read John talks about it. It's the feast of the Jews and everything to all the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as we can see here, the term circumcision in this case here is also the same. It means the same thing. It is the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Gentiles are all the rest, all the other, all the uncircumcision. Paul finishes up here. Do we then void the law through faith? <clears throat> God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. And we will also look at this in more depth in one of the further themes today, later on. Like I said, I kind of want to, as much as possible, stay to the, the train of thought that Paul is laying out in these chapters, and then I'll go back and dig into some things a little more. 
So, chapter four. Verses one through five. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he has wherefore to glory, but not before God. He just said a few verses before, where is boasting? There is none. There is no boasting. He's the same thing in Ephesians chapter 2 and other places. Um, for this description believed God was down to him for righteousness. Now to him that works is the reward not right of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, or justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So what's Paul say? He's making another, he is re rebutting another argument here is what he's doing. And the one here that's doing is, if you have a job, you have a contract with your employer, whether it's written or verbal or whatever, and so you work X number of hours or you do X task and he is indebted to you to pay you. So his, your wages for your work, when he pays you, it's a matter of debt. He is indebted to you and he owes you that work, that that recompense, whatever it might be, money or whatever you just you agreed upon. Um, so that's what Paul is saying here, that if it's work, if it's something that I am doing, then God owes me. And then I do have something to boast about. It's like, hey, God's in my debt, man. I got like a, a marker against God, you know, he's in my debt. But it's not. It's not. He's saying here, but Abraham believed God and was counted unto for righteousness. So God didn't owe Abraham anything. But God counted it. He gave him grace. He counted that for righteousness because he believed him. So that's the point that Paul's making here. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justified and godly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And that's what he does. So it's not work. It's not debt. Paul goes on here and makes another example of this out of, he's quoting from <coughs> Psalms. And he's through nine, even in his day, it also describes the blessedness of man unto whom God imputes righteousness without works, without works, <coughs> saying, Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness upon the circumcision only upon those who got the law of Moses, or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. So Paul's a question here, because remember the Jews, obviously, in this had the mindset of, well, God's on our side, and those unclean, unwashed, uncircumcised masses, he's not. So Paul asks, well, is he? And of course, he answers the, the question here in verses 10 and 11. He says, and reckoned, when he was circumcised or in uncircumcision. So... Oh, well, reckon to him when he was circumcised or uncircumcised. Well, well, he was uncircumcised. happened in that. Genesis chapter 15. He did not get circumcised for almost 25 years later in Genesis chapter 17, actually. So it says here, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal to the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believed, though they be not circumcised that the righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So now notice what, what Paul is saying here. What was the, is the promise given to anyone but Abraham that he will be the father of all them that believe? Was it made to you, Jeff, or you, Ken, or it was not? I am not going to be the father of all that believe. Absolutely not. I, he is going to be my father. I will be a saint, but I am not. That was a, a unique promise God made to Abraham that you will be the father of many nations and that your seed will be over all the earth. That promise was not made to anyone else. It was never made to anyone else. Now, did, for example, Noah, could Noah claim the same thing? Because everyone, uh, every one of us came out of Noah, yes, to that sense, but that's not what this is talking about. God made a very special promise to Abraham and to Abraham only, just as he made a very special promise to the nation of Israel at the, mount, at the foot of Mount Sinai through Moses. So when Paul is talking about her, um, 
he had the faith being uncircumcised, and he received this seal. It's the seal of what? The promise made to Abraham. It's not a seal of a promise made to me. That promise was not made to me. So we're going to get into that in a couple of verses here, but I want, want to point that out, that the, the seal that Paul is talking about here, um, it was the seal, it was given the act of circumcision, it was the seal of the promise that God made to Abraham. Um, let's see here. So some want to take this, and they want to apply the, the baby step filter to this as well. Because we see here, and we know when we read Scripture in, Exodus, in Genesis 15 and 17, that Abraham did indeed get circumcised, and he circumcised his male children, and he circumcised all the male servants that were in his household, because God told him to do that. And Israel, as a result, the nation of Israel, um, was also beholden because of the promise and the covenant made with Abraham to be circumcised physically. That's part of what they made with them. So people want to take this and say, ah, see, well, the faith of Abraham. So he believed God when he was uncircumcised, but then he took 25 years of baby steps, and then he got circumcised. So if you're going to walk in the faith of Abraham, then that means you should be circumcised at some point in time. And Paul says, this is, this is the verse that they kind of take and twist that around on. It says here, in the father of circumcision, to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. So Brian kind of covered it pretty well in Galatians part two there about the circumcision that argument has long since been settled amongst all the apostles and Paul and everybody else that do not need to be circumcised, period, ever. God does not require it of them. He does not expect it of them. And it does not endear them any more to him than being uncircumcised at all. Timothy, Paul circumcised. For Jews' sake, not for God's sake. It doesn't say in Acts chapter 16 that Paul circumcised Timothy so that he would be closer to God or he would be more godly. He did it for the Jews' sake because the Jews would have looked down on Timothy for that. Well, we don't know if Titus never got circumcised, but we know that at least at that time, it, it, is, it is possible that right Titus was not compelled to be circumcised on the merit that he must be circumcised to be saved. He was not. Now, is it possible that at some point in time later, Titus, for the same reason that Timothy was circumcised so that he would be more e effective in reaching the Jews, got circumcised? Maybe. We don't know. Scripture doesn't say. But. He may not be in the past Jewish. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Scripture doesn't, doesn't tell us. So the whole thing about circumcision is uh, that, that, that's just a smokescreen because that's not even what Paul is talking about here whatsoever. He is reiterating, again, the same point that he has several times up to this point, the fact that God sees no difference whatsoever between anyone on the face of the planet in regards to salvation. There is no physical thing that we can do or have done to ourselves that puts us in a better position to receive God's grace and salvation other than we believe him. That is it, and that is true for all. Uh, verses 13 and 14 here, let's see, going on. So the, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. The promise was to Abraham, and it wasn't through the law. And it was to his seed, his physical seed, in that they would inherit the land, but not through the law. But he was, remember, he was the only one that was promised to be the father of many nations. This is his name. He changed his name to be that even. But through the righteousness of faith, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. And again, so the whole thing about circumcision, and, and as Paul here Speaking of Gentiles being circumcised or not being circumcised, 
Not at all. That has nothing to do with what he's even talking about. In the same fashion that in Acts chapter 10, the vision that Peter had, had nothing to do with whether Peter should or should not eat unclean animals. It was to demonstrate that he should call no man unclean. But people see automatically, oh, unclean animals, that must be what it's about. It's not about that. The Pharisees did not really literally eat widows' houses. They did not. It's not about widows' houses. Many, many years before Paul penned this epistle to the Roman saints, the question of should Gentiles be circumcised and keep the law of Moses or not was long since settled. Paul is again emphasizing the fact that the Jews should not hold within their heart any idea that they have special preference in regards to salvation over other people because they are Jews. They should not. They are his elect people. They have a special purpose. They are holy for a purpose, but that does mean that they are not does not mean that they are eligible for for salvation at a higher level. In the military, it used to be when you get promoted into ranks in the NCO ranks, you get points. So depending on different things you do, different skills and training you get, and you do tests, you get points, and then you go on a list. And the higher your points, the higher up on the list are, and then they promote. 200 people or whatever, and it's the 200 people that have the highest points or whatever. Somehow the Jews had in their mind that it was the point system. It's like, well, we got more points because we're Jews, you know? So everybody got some points, but we're higher up on the list because we're Jews. So that gives us an extra 200 points off the top, you know? So, I mean, it was, you know, right. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that, that's, that was the idea that, that Paul is continuing to address with them. Um, and he's doing it in alternatingly stern and and kind ways. So he's he's so again picking up in verses fifteen through seventeen. There is no real subtext to what Paul is saying here. He's saying exactly what we read on the screen, because the law works wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. I mentioned that in Romans 5, he talks that death reigned from Adam to Moses, even sinned after the militude of Adam, because somebody had to rest, don't do this. Damn it. Um, but he says, therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, to the end that the promise might be sure to all, all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom we be he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things which are not as though they were. Quite a statement there, because the law works wrath. And then his, his evidence, his philosophical answer or proof for that is, well, the law works wrath because if there is no law, then nobody dies. There's no punishment. If there's no law, there's absolutely no punishment. So the law works wrath. A few verses earlier, he says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. It's not the, the answer to sin. It's the knowledge of sin. We'll dig into that a little bit more today and in further parts as well. So... <clears throat> Some attempt to take the, these verses and other verses in Paul's writings and others in the New Testament to say, see, that means that the law that was given to Moses actually was given to all mankind and was around all generations. So all the law of Moses, everything that's in the law of Moses, you know, all the stuff about the every little jot and tittle that's in the law, um, they say, see, that must be under the law. But Paul, remember, Paul made it clear in chapter 2, that the Gentiles did not have that law. They had a law that God will judge them by, and it was their conscience, their God-given conscience. It doesn't mean people can do whatever feels right. People can do whatever God says they should do. But most people disobey that. Whether, whether they've had it written down in stones or in a book that had blood sprinkled on it, or that it was a general revelation that God gives all mankind that they were disobedient to. Right. Yes. Yep. 
So Paul here is uh, making the point that the law doesn't provide mercy. The law brings about wrath because when you break it, then there's judgment. And all it does is make it evident to you that you have broken the law. It's the knowledge of sin. Um, right. That every mouth may be stopped. So that's talking about Abraham. And it says here that he was before God and that it, uh, he understood it wasn't by the law, but Abraham goes on to say, or Paul goes on to say about Abraham in verses 18 through 20, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken or promised. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving God the glory. Again, Paul is demonstrating here that Abraham's status with God of being a friend of God and being the father of the faithful has nothing to do with anything Abraham did. It had to do with the fact that God imputed his belief unto him as righteousness, period. It had nothing to do with any works he had done before that time or after that time. So carrying on, um, Paul continues to speak of Abraham's faith. That's a wonderful model for us. And being fully persuaded that we had what he had promised, he was able to perform. And so that goes back to what I was talking about before with the fact that when God says something by two immutable things, it's going to happen. If God promises something, we just need to make sure that we're not trying to bring promises to us that God didn't make us and understand what he has promised us and what has he promised us. He's promised us that in this life, we will have tribulation. And he has promised us that if we endure by his spirit to the end, not that we earn it, but that we allow him to live in us and live through us, that we will overcome. And and as Abraham understands, um, we're fully persuaded that he is able to perform that. He can do that. And what he promised, he can actually do. So he can take a schmuck like me and clean me up and give me his spirit and actually bring me to the desired end. That's That's a great thing. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not not written for his sake alone that he imputed it to him, but for us also to him it shall be imputed if we believe on him. What will be imputed on us? The righteousness of Christ. Not the promise that he will be the father of many nations. That was for him and him alone. To whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Read a quick verse here, um, just on the resurrection and the fact that how big a deal that is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 16 through 20. We have here, for if the dead rise not, <clears throat> then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. The resurrection is a very integral doctrine to the Christian life because our hope is in that. God raised him from the dead and he has promised in like manner he will raise us as well. And it is that hope that we hold on to. And it is by his spirit that we know of it. And it is by his spirit that we will receive it. So as I had said um, in last part, I'm not going to dig into four real deep because that kind of rolls in with nine, 10, and 11. So I'm going to come back to some of the stuff out of four then. So <coughs> that has been one of the things that's been wonderfully challenging um, in this, doing this Romans is there's, there's a lot of overlap in everything and stuff. And so how to, how to break things up so that I'm not up here for four hours um, at a time and yet still cover everything. So, And in reality, the fact that 
Paul reiterates similar themes throughout the letter time and time again is important. I mean, that's because obviously he believed by the Spirit that it was important for him to reiterate that again and again and again from different angles and in different aspects. So that's kind of it for the kind of once through for chapters three and four. And I'm going to take a look at some further theme topics. And I have four of them again, this part, like it did last time. So buckets, do evil that good may come, establish the law and stop every mouth. So we're going to cover those four kind of further theme topics. So first and foremost, buckets. And actually, this is a theme, a major theme throughout the entire epistle and and a lot of Paul's writings in other places as well. So this is kind of, we'll go right back to, this is somewhat based on uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. So what advantage then has the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So, as I'd said, the the example with the promotion points, the Jews thought that they had a leg up in the whole plan of salvation for mankind just because they were Jews, that they were physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And certainly they did have an advantage, but it had nothing to do with that. And Paul has made that very clear in everything that we have read essentially up to this point in the letter to Romans. Um, He does that in other places as well. And so I'm going to dip into Galatians real quick here. Chapter 3, verses 27 through 29. Ryan will expound more on this in a couple weeks here. But uh, so for as many of of (coughs) you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, what promise? The promise Paul talked about actually earlier in the chapter in Galatians, the promise of salvation by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That was the promise that we are all heirs to receive. Not the promise that we can be father of many nations, but the promise that really matters, the one that we can be saved. Um, And it doesn't matter, Jew or Greek. So again, emphasize here, he uses the word Jew, that's talking about all the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then Greek is everybody else. Male or female, there's no third thing in there. That's everybody. Bond or free, there's no thing in there between. That's, you know, that's it. You're all one. You're all one. So he's just kind of emphasizing the same thing over and over. Um, and again, I got here. So he's simply trying to re, 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 re-emphasize the fact that God is not a respecter of persons. So in general, as Paul just says here in Galatians, there's two groups or two buckets of people in humanity. There's people in the bad bucket and there's people in the good bucket. The good bucket are the people that will receive eternal life. And the bad bucket are people that we will not receive eternal life. They will be destroyed. So there's two buckets. There's basically two buckets. Um, And as Paul emphasized in Galatians 3 there, you can't say, okay, well, the Jews are in one bucket automatically um, or got a better chance of being in one bucket than the others. And um, so that's been, that's been the, the, the way mankind has gone, not just Jews. There's plenty of other people groups throughout the ages that have tried to equate themselves with the good bucket and them other people with the bad bucket. And that's the problem. And that's what the issue that Paul is addressing time and time again here in Romans. And in Romans, he's ta- addressing the fact that some of the Jews held the idea, and maybe some of the Gentiles thought this also, that the Jews had a leg up, that somehow automatically, because you're a Jew, you got a better chance of going into the good bucket. And the Gentiles have a less chance of going into the good bucket. Right. Yes. So, But that's it, definitely Jews and Gentiles aren't the only divisions <coughs> that have occurred. I mean, there, the man, mankind over the generations has come up with all kinds of perversions, you know, based on race, you know, based on race, based handed versus right-handed people. We know left-handed people are got a better chance. Absolutely. Um, so <laughs> yes. Right. So, 
Um, and and it's it's just it's evil. I mean, it, it, people have used um, throughout the generations um, this idea that somehow there are certain people. You know, the the mark of Cain. I mean, it's awful that you know people say the mark of Cain is the black skin. The the Mormons up until they were just absolutely forced for financial reasons to change, <coughs> um, believe that the the people were. I mean, that was their. You know, and then you put on there the white skin are this fetus so it, it's it's awful you know it's horrible those are just some you know believe it's the not has nothing to do with skin color <clears throat> some may believe there's some other division but throughout human history mankind has <clears throat> had a propensity to make these divisions up these buckets so ultimately all agree there's just two buckets of people in the world as far as god is concerned there's those who will receive eternal life and those who will not but missions and individuals over the over the generation have tried to define outside of God's definition who's in the buckets and or who has a better chance of being in the buckets. And that is just evil and wrong. And God is not a respecter of persons. Um, let's read here, for example, in Ephesians chapter two, verses fourteen through eighteen. Paul here is saying, for he, Jesus, is our peace, who hath made both one, both Jews and Gentiles, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. So it's just one bucket. There's one bucket of people that is going to be saved. It's not they're inside that bucket are you know, mostly Jews with this little sprinkling of Gentiles or whatever, or mostly blacks with a little sprinkling of white people or whatever, whatever the divisions people might come up with. God's the one that makes the division. And there's just one group of people, his saints. Um, for to make it himself twain, one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. So here Paul, again, is talking about the idea that Jews and Gentiles are somehow different in God's eyes regarding salvation, and they're not. He's saying they aren't. Having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them which were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. God is not a vector of person at all, in the slightest. So if you want to know how to divide the buckets, we got some verses here for you. Revelation chapter 20, verse 15. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the bad bucket, the lake of fire. Who was written in there is in the good bucket, period. Another place, John chapter 10, verses 27 to 30. Jesus says, hear my sheep, hear my voice, and I know them. So he knows who's in his bucket and who's not in his bucket. And they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. There's a good bucket definition. The ones who Jesus and God, the Father know, they're in the good bucket, period. Now, can we within our own realm, have an idea of who might or who might be kind of like leaning over the edge of the good bucket to fall out by their fruits, yes. But ultimately, we cannot judge another over, you're not in the bucket, man. We can say, hey, based on the way you're acting, the fruit that you are displaying, it does not appear to be the fruit of the Spirit. Thus, you may have an issue. You might want to look at that. But first and foremost, we always need to watch ourselves. But God is the one. We read that out of Romans chapter 9, remember, where it's not him who wills or him who runs, but it's God who shows mercy. So that's it for the bucket list. So the next one, um, do evil that good may come. So if you notice here, like the evil's inside the good there, so it's like, yeah. I didn't make it up. I stole it from the internet somewhere. The same thing with the buckets. I didn't do that. It was on the internet. So as far as the picture. So 
So Romans 3, verses 7 through 8. This is kind of the, the verses that brings us about here. So for, for if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner, and not rather, as we slanders be reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Now, Paul doesn't give us a specific example of what was in this exactly they're being accused of. Um, it may be something along the lines of, we read in Acts 21 that the, the, the Jews in Jerusalem thought Paul was going around and telling their brethren, hey, you can forsake Moses, which he wasn't doing. That might be it. It could be any number of things. So, but just, and I think that's why Paul doesn't necessarily go into it because oftentimes they were accusing him falsely of all kinds of stuff. So I think Paul is just making the point here. Look, doing evil so that good comes is wrong. Don't do that. And some people even accuse us from that. And those who accuse us, um, their damnation is just. That's what he's saying here. So I'm going to give a couple examples here. Here's an example of, I think, I think what happened here is they hit like a deer or something driving down the road. Um, and so car got kind of mangled up. Nobody got hurt. I don't think, but the, the father thought, Hey, here's an opportunity. I can do a nice little photo op with my young daughter. So this is really cute here. So I thought, so that's, very funny, you know, so that's kind of, I would call that a good thing. It's, you know, the little girl seems to be having a blast, like she's kicking the windshield in and everything. So, so you can say this is a good thing that came out of an evil thing. But does that mean that, you know, the wreck initially is like, wow, let's go wreck again so we can get another good photo op? Well, no, of course not. Of course not. So, so is, I think that's fairly, fairly clear. How about here's another one. This is a, not a real thing, but this is fictional, but it's, um, Robin Hood. So the idea of stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. So his name is Hood, not he wears a hood, but because he is a hood. He's a thief. He steals. He steals. People idolize this, you know, this idea that somehow, oh, it's, you know, all the, them rich people are awful and everything. And certainly, certainly are there many wealthy people who are far too stingy or careless with the wealth that God has given them? Absolutely so. That's absolutely true. But it's not our job to go extort that from them. God will take care of that. God's got that all covered. So, um, and whether it's a, a fictional medieval, a fictional medieval character, or it's a modern day wannabe, it's wrong. You cannot do it. It should not be done. So, yeah, I know it's, I don't get political normally, but I, it's like, I could not resist. I could not resist. So, <laughs> so let's read another example, a little one, a little more serious here. A little more serious. All right, so one afternoon, a mother took her six-year-old son shopping in one of the large department stores in a local mall. While doing her shopping, she allowed her son to stay in the video game area with several other boys that were already there. When she was finished with her shopping, she returned to find her son and all the other boys gone. The store manager informed her that there had been a scuffle and had broken out, and a security guard had forced all the boys to leave the store. Frantic, she spent about 90 minutes looking for her son and then finally called the police. Because, I mean, you know, at first you think he's probably just in another store or whatever. So, But after about 90 minutes, she called the police. About two weeks later, about 130 miles away, in a drainage ditch next to a big road, they found the child's head. They never found the body at all. Um, the place was Hollywood, Florida. The date was July 27th, 1981. The boy's name was Adam. His mother's name was Rivera, and his father's name was John, John Walsh of America's Most Wanted. So we can read here, that Walsh and his wife, Reve, founded what would become the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I'm sorry, it kind of breaks me up what happened to the kid. And in 1988, Walsh became TV's most famous criminal hunter, host of America's Most Wanted. The first most wanted perp was captured within a week of the show's debut. Over the years, Walsh and his millions of viewers helped police catch more than 1,100 cop killers, terrorists, rapists, and kidnappers. 
fugitives who were sometimes captured almost before the show's credits rolled. Now, I would call that a very good thing. But does that mean that the good, the bad thing was good? And and had that not happened to their son, Adam, this probably would not have happened either. I doubt very much that this would have happened. Nonetheless, there is never a good purpose for evil. God can turn evil into good. He can use an evil thing. But this is in no way. So now, America's Most Wanted went off the air a number of years ago. Now, I don't remember exactly when. But uh, so does that mean now somebody else's kid's got to be horrifically killed so we can have another show? I mean, that's, should we do that? Is that we could do evil so that good will come out of it? I mean, that's that is the question, whether it's a small thing that seems somewhat innocuous or it think, seems to be just like stealing from the rich and giving to the poor or it's something horrible like this. Paul is making the point that it is never correct to do evil so that good should come out of it ever, never, ever, ever, ever. Never. All right. So this one here, this next one established the law. You know, this probably will be expanded on. I bet you Brian might talk about it in a couple of weeks. Maybe Ken will next week. I don't know what he's doing, but um, but I think also in further parts, this also uh, we'll talk about this more. But uh, so this third further theme. Establish the law. So now I'm a law. So, so this is somewhat based on Romans 3.31. Uh, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Yea, we establish the law. So what is Paul saying here? What does he mean? I mean, because he is already he's already saying the law works wrath. The law speaks to those who are under the law that the law, there's no, you know, it doesn't, there's no forgiveness in the law. So let's take a look at what is Paul talking about. So let's take a look at Paul in Romans 11 here, verses 26 through 29. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, that I shall take away their sins. And concerning the go- as concerning the gospel, they are enemies. So the gospel is the good news about salvation through Jesus Christ. That was not part of the covenant that he had made with them. Were there types and foreshadows of that in the covenant that he made with them through, through Moses? Absolutely. But the covenant was that they would have the land. That was the covenant. That was the promise that he made to Abraham, and he confirmed through through Moses. He says here, so as the gospel, they are enemies because of their unbelief. And the enemies, anyone, be they Jew or Gentile, are enemies for the gospel's sake because of their unbelief. Um, but in addition to that, because of their general national unbelief and rejection of Messiah, God has somewhat put their national aspirations on hold. So there is no real nation of Israel now as it existed in old days. But God says, don't worry, I'm an, I promised Abraham. I promised Abraham. So that's going to happen. So don't think. So that's, as he goes on, it says, for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So again, and we'll get into this, what, what the bigger context in Romans 11 and a few parts here. But what Paul is saying here is that there, there's, there was a covenant that was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then passed down through Moses. They were given the law, and they were brought into the land by the hand of Moses and Joshua. And then you read in Deuteronomy that at that time, God said, all this stuff I promised Abraham, now it's true. You are as the stars of the sea, the stars of the sea, the stars of the sky and the sand of the seashore. So all the, and, and may you be ten times as many, he says. Um, But as concerning the good news, the gospel, which is salvation through Jesus Christ, they are enemies, as is any human being, Jew or Gentile, that rejects Messiah. They are enemies. Let's take a look in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 8. Let's take a look at a little more in depth here of what... Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 8. 
For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, which he loves all people, he's not a respecter of persons, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. That's why he did it. And that's the same thing we read that Paul says in Romans 11, why he can, they're still his elect. They are still his special people. So hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he did that. Now, the thing that gets twisted around here is that for thou, in verse 7 there, for thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. So we have this idea in mind that holy means righteous in his eyes and redeemed in regards to salvation. And we know that many who were in Israel will not receive salvation. We know that's true. We know that, in fact, uh, yeah, I want to cover my notes here first. So they were absolutely holy people. They were set apart for a purpose. But the Jews had assumed that that purpose then gave them a leg up in regards to salvation. Now, some Jews, at least in the time of Jesus, didn't even believe in the resurrection or anything. The Sadducees, for example. So they, they must have just believed that the promises were entirely and 100% physical and there was nothing for any human being beyond that whatsoever. And, and if that were the case, then the, the place of the Jews in regards to all of humanity is very elevated. But in reality, all humanity still has to pass the bucket test, no matter whether they're Jew or Gentile. And this holy people here does not mean that they are more predisposed to be in God's bucket whatsoever. This holy people means he did it because he loved them and he had promised to Abraham and then that promise passed down to Isaac, and then Jacob, whose name was changed to, Israel, changed to Israel, that he would do this. And this is why he has done it. He brought them out of the world to be a holy nation. And we'd read where Paul talked about in Romans 4, or Romans 3, and in Romans 9, where he gave them all kinds of stuff, the oracles of God, that by the, through the flesh, um, Messiah came into the world, that they had the promises and the covenants, but the problem, as I said before, that Paul continues to address is that the Jews had assumed that they were God's people when Jesus came on the scene to do what? Not to create a nation, but to save men. And he came to save all men. And he came through Israel. So they were given, as it were, kind of a front row seat to watch the unfolding of God's actions amongst mankind but they, as all other man, all other humans, most of them weren't interested and they rejected it. They did not believe, they did not have faith, and as a result, they did not benefit from the real promise that was made to Abraham. Um, so as he says here in Deuteronomy, they were redeemed from their earthly bondage in Egypt, um, but that does not mean that they are also redeemed from their bondage to sin. No, that only comes through that which is promised by the seed in Galatians 3, Paul talks about that, which is Christ. God keeps his promise to Abraham for his physical people through Isaac and Jacob, but that provides no assurance of salvation in and of itself. In the same sense that God's covenant with all mankind through Noah, that he will never flood the earth again, doesn't ensure or provide salvation for anyone, although it provides an opportunity for all to be saved, if they believe. So the same thing. The Jews did have an advantage. I mean, they... they knew in more specific terms who God was. But all mankind is given at least some knowledge of him enough to be saved. Let's take a look here in Numbers chapter 14. And we'll see here, verses 30 through 32. Doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, which you said shall be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness. So was God unjust? He promised them. When they came out of Egypt, he said, hey, I am taking you to the promised land. 
let's go. Moses, lead your people to the promised land. And yet here we see just a little bit over a year after they left Egypt that God was finished with them. They had rejected him time and time and time again. And as a result of all the people that came out of Egypt of 20 and older, only two of them would actually physically see the promise. So does that make God unjust or that he did not fulfill his promise to Abraham? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And in fact, in uh, just a few verses before this, I don't have a slide for it, but in uh, verse 14, we read of Caleb. It says here, <coughs> here. Oh, 20, verse 24, sorry. In verse 24, but my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein he went, whither unto he went, and his seed shall possess it. Because Caleb had a different spirit, what was that? It was the spirit of belief and faith. That's what it was. That's what it was. So only two. So either God is a liar because he said, he brought him out, and he said, I'm taking you in the promised land, and yet they did not go into the promised land. They all died in the wilderness. So if we're to interpret God's promise that Paul talks about in Romans 11, to be something like that. Well, it's not. So all Israel will not be saved in the sense all Israel who believe will be saved, but that's true of all mankind. All mankind who believe will be saved. So there's two covenants. There was the covenant that was promised to Abraham for the land for his seed, and that happened. Then there was a covenant to Abraham that he would also be the father of many nations, and that is in regards to the Messiah. And that also has come to pass. So the, the, the covenant of the land and the one that was brought through um, Moses had nothing to do with salvation, although certainly they were given an advantage in salvation in that they had more information than the general Joe on the street but it did not give them any automatic leg up because it's only by faith. And it's only by the faith that Abraham displayed and that's written down in Scripture for us as an example. Um, a quick point on that out of Galatians chapter 3. Verses 16 through 18. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and thy seed, which is Christ. So that's the promise that we are heirs of. That's the promise, the most important promise, that the Israelites were heirs of also. Any of those who believed could receive this promise, which is the promise of eternal life. And this I say, that the covenant which was confirmed before God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul. The promise that was made to Abraham, that all men would receive the opportunity to be saved by the seed of Jesus Christ, the law had nothing to do with. It didn't change it. It didn't affect it. It didn't disannul it. It, didn't, it had nothing to do with it. That it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So what inheritance is Paul speaking of? The one that includes the seed from all nations, the one that is through Christ, not the law at Sinai. That was a promise, but that wasn't to all people. That was to his physical seed. Um... <laughs> So again, to reiterate the fact that Israel is his elect people. They were a holy people. God gave them a special place amongst all humanity. But it did not give them an advantage in regards to salvation other than they had more information. But it didn't benefit them, and it wouldn't have benefited other nations anymore. So it's not talking down to the Jews. It's human nature apart from God to reject him. We're enmity. 
Um, the law, the promises, everything is 100% established. Salvation by faith without any works of the law does not disannul the promise. The law also does not superimpose itself over the promise of salvation through faith either, as that promise preceded the law by many generations. The promise is much older than the law at Sinai. The promise made to Abraham is much older. So, faith does not disannul the law. It establishes the law. It shows. And the last of the four further themes for today's sermon, that every mouth may be stopped before him. So that comes from, essentially, Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says unto them who are under the law. Why? That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So again, going back to the fact that he here he says, all the world may become guilty. So he made clear in chapter 2 that all the world did not receive the law of Moses or any anything even similar to it or like it. That for many, many, many generations between Adam and the Moses, there was no such thing. And then even after Moses, there was just some little group that had a law. So it says here, um, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight by the deeds of the law. So people want to take and twist this and say, oh, well, well, that means sacrifice. It's talking about sacrifices. The deeds of the law, the ones that forgave sin was sacrifice. But actually, let's read here what he says in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. He says, for what the law could not do. The law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sent his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. And as Tim mentioned there in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. It is not possible. The law, right, there's other places. So wait a minute now. Is God a liar? Again, is he a liar? Is he unjust? Let's go back to Leviticus chapter 4, for example, and let's read through, again, kind of skip through verses 27 through 31. And there's actually several different um, groups of verses that essentially say the same thing for different groups of people. So it says here, And if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, while he does somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and be guilty, or if his sin which he has sinned, come to his knowledge. Then he shall bring his offering for his sin, which he has sinned. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savor unto the Lord. And the priest shall make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. Well, this verse here, flat out, and and there's this is the only one. And actually, at the beginning of chapter 6, it talks about intentional sin, even. There's like, if you intentionally do something, you got to make restitution, and then you can go ask for forgiveness. I was actually surprised. I thought there was nowhere, but it is. It's in there too. So even intentional thing, like if you bear false witness against somebody (coughs) or if you steal something from somebody and you get caught, if you bake restitution, you can then... I can give you another one. (coughs) But we have a dilemma here, it seems like. Now, I only read two verses out of the New Testament, but there are a number of verses in the New Testament that say that those sacrifices, these sacrifices that we're reading about here in Leviticus, cannot, never did forgive sin. So the only way this can be explained that I I can understand is the fact that he is talking about two different manners of forgiveness. So if we understand the covenant 
given to the nation of Israel through Moses was about the physical land and the blessings that they would receive in that land, then these sacrifices can tone in that context for their sin. So in other words, if you will do these things, then I will let you stay in the land. If you will do these things, then I will continue to bless you in the land. But these sacrifices have absolutely nothing to do with salvation. They may have types that we can see a foreshadow that might point forward to Christ, but these sacrifices have nothing to do with salvation whatsoever at all, period. These are all directly related to the, related to the physical promise that the covenant that was given at Sinai has to do that was promised to Abraham that his seed, physical seed, will live in the promised land, that they will be a special people, a holy people, peculiar unto him. But these sacrifices did not, do not, and never will forgive sin in regards to salvation, not one single bit whatsoever. The blood of bulls and goats cannot or never will and never has forgive sin, period. Um, going on here to Hebrews, let's read Hebrews 11 or 7 verses 11 through 12. Kind of want to dig into this point a little bit. What do we see here in, in Hebrews? If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, and that's exactly what it's talking about. So if, if you could be made perfect by the Levitical sacrifices, for under it, the people received the law. Moses was a Levite as well. Um, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek? And, um, and not be called after the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. The law changed. Even the law of the covenant made with Israel. But nonetheless, the law changed at that point because even up to this point, um, the point here that the, Hebrew, the, the writer of the Hebrews is writing in human history, um, sacrifice for a to gods was a common thing. And we read about, for example, Naaman, who had leprosy, and he went and he was healed of leprosy. And then he said, Well, I'm not going to, I'm going to only pray to this God. And he actually asked for two barrels of dirt to take back to his homeland so that he could make sacrifice to God, to the God of Israel on that dirt and not right down the holy ground, essentially. Right. So that, so, so the idea we read about, you know, sacrifices that were made by, all kinds of men. What about um, Jethro or Ruel, Moses' father-in-law, for example? So there were sacrifices. So this was the, I don't have the verse in here, but this was the time of Reformation. So essentially, that that whole thing, which never forgave anybody's sin, the only, so David, he performed a sacrifice after um, his sin with, with Uriah and Bathsheba, but that sin that sacrifice did not forgive his sin. What forgive his sin? Read Psalm 51. You'll see why his sin was forgiven. And it had nothing to do with sacrifice. In fact, he says in there, he didn't want sacrifice. It was not that. He did make it, but it was not that that forgave his sin whatsoever. And it never was. We see here in uh, verse 19, the law made nothing perfect but the bringing in of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto God. And then up um, in Hebrews 10, verses 17 through 22, we see here, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no, no more sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. This is the same thing that Abraham did. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's it. That, that sacrifice never did anything, except it was a way that, National Israel could remain in the land and continue to receive the blessings. That's what God promised to them. And as long and and you read through the prophets, they quit doing that stuff. And God, I'm putting you out. I'm going to put you out of the land. I'm going to put you're not keeping the covenant. I'm putting you out. I'm putting you out. 
is there are there foreshadowings in what was given through Moses of the real deal? Absolutely, but that doesn't mean anything. I mean, there's foreshadowings all the way back in the Garden of Eden. We can see foreshadowings, but we're in the time now. Paul says here in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, back to this here, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And what law is he talking about here? People want to say, well, that's the, that's, that's the sacrificial law. But no, Paul here in, in previous verses and in future verses in Romans 7, 7 here, he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. And so what law and what sin is he talking about? For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So it's in the sacrificial law. It's talking about the law of what to do and what not to do. And he says here, this is nothing but the knowledge of sin and that it, it brings wrath. It's nothing but wrath. It will not save. It does not save anybody. Think. Make sure. It's the last place. I don't want to lie. No, it's not. So. Um, Galatians chapter 3, back there, verses 22 through 25. <laughs> this is the last time in Galatians 3. <laughs> but the scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. It's the same thing he said in Romans. It's the same message. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up in the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. Oh, the knowledge of sin, what sin? Thou shalt not covet. Lust is wrong. That's what it's not talking about the sacrificial law. Yes, that too, but that never, the Levitical priesthood was never imposed upon all mankind. Um, the door was open so that if certain people that were not of the nation wanted to join themselves to it, they could. There was a process that they could undergo, but there was never any requirement. Naaman is a perfect example. The prophet didn't tell him, oh, no, no, you can't go back. You got to come join us now. Let's go get you circumcised and get all this stuff. No, there was no commandment whatsoever to mankind that they have to come join Israel. What did they have to do? They had to have faith and believe in the one. And if they did that, they would be saved. And in this life, they would have tribulation. It says here, so the law, the, the law is clearly what he's talking about. The law that was given at Sinai, even the law, even further back than that, the law that was given to mankind in their own conscience, that doesn't save us just because we're aware of what is right and wrong. It just brings wrath. When we do something wrong, we feel guilty about it. We should, hopefully. But we are no longer under a schoolmaster. And what is the schoolmaster? It's the law. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But now he, now hath he, Jesus, obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Because the promises of the covenant that was made at Sinai were physical promises. They were promises of the land, a blessing within the land, of an opportunity to be closer to God, and of an opportunity to be an example to the rest of mankind, of someone or a nation that could be close to God. But the, And those are great promises, but... The covenant that we're under has way better promises. Way better promises. Romans 8, 11. But the spirit of him that raised up Jesus, the same spirit that was in Caleb, for example, that we read about in Numbers, from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwells in you. It is, by, it is the ministry of the spirit it is not the ministry of things written on stone that we are under. Let's see here. Do I have? Yeah. So we talked about that before. It's the spirit. Carrying on in verses 14 through 17 in Romans 8. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. No respecter persons. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, 
but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Far better promises. The promise of being indwelt by his spirit now. The promise of receiving eternal life. Not to say that the promises made to Israel were not good promises, but these are way better promises. Way better promises. Romans 4, verses 4 and 5. Now to him that works is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that works not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. How simple can that be? I mean, that is completely and entirely simple. So, Paul does not, in these chapters, uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4, really um, kind of do any little footnotes of like, oh, don't take what I'm saying and go think you can do anything you want. But I know people have a propensity, and myself at times too, to think, well, yeah, but people got to know. So, we're, like I said, we're like I read here, we are under the ministry of the Spirit now. It's not the the law written on tablets or anything, it's the Spirit. It bears witness within us, and it motivates us, and it empowers us to do that which what God would have us do, that which is, that which is pleasing. So I, I snagged one of Kevin's verses here too. Sorry, buddy. Micah 6, 8. So he has showed you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of thee. But do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with thy God. Do that. And no worries. Are people going to take advantage of it? Yep. But God is not mocked. For whosoever, whatsoever man sows, he shall also reap. And what he sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And he that sows to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So, yes, are people going to take this just like I talked about earlier with are there wealthy people who misuse and are too stingy with their wealth? Absolutely there are. No, God is not mocked. So are people going to take this liberty that we have in Christ, which affords people an easier easier opportunity to follow their own wicked hearts and disobey? Are we going to somehow think that then God has made a mistake? No, he's got it all covered. We got to worry about ourselves and helping our brothers and sisters when they fall short. So we don't need to worry about that was what, Remember, the law that was given at Sinai was a very physical thing, and it had very physical promises and blessings. We have a much better covenant with much better promises and a much better priest, and we have his spirit by which we can live. So I still think these are really the two main themes that Paul wants us to remember throughout his epistle here. So I want to reiterate them again. For there is no respect to persons with God, The just shall live by faith. That is the answer to the mystery of godliness. It is really that simple. Thanks, brothers and sisters. Godspeed. And we will be back next week.